Welcome to Strictly Facts, a guide to Caribbean history and culture, hosted by me, Alexandria Miller. Strictly Facts teaches the history, politics, and activism of the Caribbean and connects these themes to contemporary music and popular culture. Wong people, welcome back to another episode of Strictly Facts, a guide to Caribbean history and culture. Now, if you've been a part of the Strictly Facts family for any bit of time, you know just how much music means to me. Not only has the Caribbean shaped and influenced music genres and generations of artists from across the world, but right here at home, we've been able to advocate for ourselves, empower ourselves, and spearhead serious social change all through the power of music. So joining me for this discussion today is Dr. Danielle Brown. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for being a guest on this episode and talking about one of my favorite things in the world. Please tell us a bit about yourself, where in the Caribbean is near and dear to you, and what led you to your work on Caribbean music? Well, thank you, Alexandria, for having me here. Um, It's great to be here talking about one of the things that I love the most, music. Uh, So a little bit of background about me. So I was born and raised in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, um, a Caribbean enclave in in central Brooklyn. My parents are from Trinidad and Tobago. And I'll say I always had an interest in music. My parents weren't musicians, but I've just always loved music and appreciated it. And I was really surrounded by Caribbean music all of my life. I always say that music was the soundtrack uh, to my life, not just Caribbean music, but especially living in East Flatbush, and growing up there in the 80s and 90s, uh, Caribbean music, especially calypso, soca, reggae, dance hall, was all around. You know, you heard it on the streets. And I say, you didn't even need a radio to know what the latest tunes were, right? And so uh, I actually went to middle school in Bushwick. I went to Philippa Schuyler, a performance art school. Um, it was more than that, but it specialized in performing arts. And so I studied music from a young age. And uh, I would say when I went to college, especially, I decided to major in music and I went to college. I went to Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and many of the professors there uh, were studying Caribbean culture. Um, Either they were from the Caribbean or they were just studying Caribbean culture. And so I was very fortunate at that time to be able to study Caribbean music and culture, literature. And uh, we were also very fortunate to have um, Caribbean groups come. So we had um, the Malik Folk Performing Company um, visited. Earl Loveless, incredible writer, author, playwright, Tony Hall, um, all coming from Trinidad and Tobago. And then probably the highlight for me, um, Dr. Hollis Liverpool, also known as the Mighty Chalk Dust, spent a semester at Trinity College and I was able to take a class with him. And so that was very exciting. And so really from college on on is when I really decided to focus on music and and make that essentially my, my study and then eventually my career. I know in this study of music, particularly for you, um, especially having family hailing from Trinidad and Tobago, one thing that has been really integral to your more so research side of your work has been the study of Parang. And so I just thought, why don't we start there as a perfect point, right? For those who may not be familiar with Parang's history, just give us a bit of a background about um, Parang, highlighting really Trinidad's relationship to Parang. And even, you know, the colonial histories, there are several ways we could take this question, but why don't we start there for our conversation? Yeah, sure. There's a lot to talk about there. And it's funny, I kind of went back to my dissertation. It's been a while. It's been nearly 20 years since I I did my research on Parang, even though I, you know, still perform. Um, But there's the kind of performance side and then there's the the academic side of it. And so I'll just say for for people who, who don't know, I guess I can describe Parang as a musical genre and also a performance practice in Trinidad and Tobago that's most associated with the Christmas holiday season, although it's not exclusive to Christmas, but that's what people mostly associate Parang with. And there's also the tradition of going house to house um, during Christmas time. So Parang or Paranda in Spanish, really it's refers to kind of a musical spree or a a collection of people who go from house to house, right? Kind of making merry. And so that's what the word uh, refers to. And so historically during the Christmas holiday season, which in Trinidad starts earlier than in the United States, you can even say like Baranderos um, start maybe even September, October, and then go right through January 6th, um, which is Three Kings Day, Feast of the Epiphany, or also known as 
Les Rois in Trinidad, which is um, French Creole for Three Kings. And so the house to house tradition really would have people, uh, how it was described to me, and I've gone house to house, but you know, it's changed over the years a little bit. So back in the day, people would go house to house and usually men, it was really a male dominated tradition in terms of the house to house tradition until later on. They would travel in groups and they would go to a house early wee hours of the morning when people are asleep and they would start up with the song at someone's door, you know, designed to wake them up. And the idea is that you're bringing them a gift of song. Now, sometimes people may not want a gift of song, especially if the, the baranderos are rowdy. Uh, so sometimes they also were known for, you know, drinking a lot and making a lot of noise. But in that case, the older heads told me, you just leave the lights off and you just act like you don't hear them. But if you, if you would like to invite them in, you know, people would come, they would sing a, a serenal or a song that's called a levanta, literally to wake up in Spanish. They would let you in if they wanted you inside of the house. And then the baranderos would sing songs on the birth of, of Christ or that pertain to the, the Christmas story. And so one of the songs that um, sung was the, the um, Annunciacion or the Annunciation, which told of, of the angel Gabriel's visit to the Virgin Mary to let her know that she will um, be with child and give birth to uh, Jesus Christ. And then you had the Nacimiento, and those are songs actually on the birth of Christ. So um, really a praise song um, celebrating his birth. We'll talk about um, Jesus, you know, being born in a manger, surrounded by animals and, and those sorts of things. And then there were secular songs that were also sung too, and there are a wide variety of them. So the best part is actually at some time during the, the parang session, it's tradition for the host to give the musicians food. And it's usually traditional Christmas food. So several pastels, black cake, you know, coffee to keep them, keep them awake, um, ham, bread, those sorts of things. And then finally, um, when they're leaving, they sing a despedida, which literally means farewell. And it's a song essentially thanking the host for their hospitality, you know, wishing them a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and telling them, hey, um, look forward to seeing you the next time around. And so that's the tradition of the house to house parang. Over the years, um, parang competitions have developed. So it's not just the house to house, but parang has really kind of entered the national scene um, through the competitions. And then also there were certain crucial points in time. For example, um, Daisy Boisin, widely known as the, the mother of parang, um, she came on the scene and really encouraged a generation of women to start participating in Parang. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, as you know, these things have, you know, so many different points. But yeah, that's, so that's in a nutshell of what Parang is. And again, a very kind of simplified um, version. I mean, I think for me, one thing that really stands out and why I definitely wanted that to be a part of our conversation today is, you know, especially when you think of music in Trinidad and Tobago, you think of soca, you think of calypso. Um, and it's oftentimes sort of like a one-sided positioning of what we think of Trinidad's music in particular. And so I think adding the influence of Parang and just how central it is to Trinidadian culture, I think is really important, especially, you know, as you were talking, there were several words that you were um, using that were in Spanish, for example, right? And I oftentimes think we sometimes, especially for the Anglophone Caribbean that, you know, several of us were at one point colonized by Spain, we neglect to talk about that influence. So could you a little bit shift just in terms of not just about Parang particularly, but what it says about the Spanish influence in the Caribbean and in Trinidad? Yeah, and if I may, I want to touch on what you said because you you actually highlight one of the central points of my dissertation. Um, so the the dissertation was called Parang Side Coming: The Color and Sound of Parang Spanish Heritage, and really what I was looking at was looking at how the color. Um, so in many ways, looking at issues of race and the sound in terms of um, Spanish, right? Um, Spanish language. A Parang has con really contributed to it being marginalized. In, in public and also academic discussions of music from Trinidad. And again, as you mentioned, a lot of the times um, we pigeonhole countries in terms of the, the sounds that we expect to hear from them. And so for Trinidad, a lot of times, the genres that are, are being pushed are Calypso and, and Steel Pen, 
even though Trinidad has many other genres and, and Trinidadians listen to a wide variety of musics. And so I really wanted to look at at those issues and specifically how how race or the idea of race and, and who is a Trinidadian and what makes something representative of Trinidad. And I think because traditionally Parang was sung in Spanish, it did not represent Trinidad to many people. And I'm not really, I'm even talking less about Trinidadians because Trinidadians see it as part of the culture, you know, and that's shifted over the years, how that's happened too. But really looking at people coming from the outside and saying, oh, this, this Spanish music, how is this Trinidad? And so in terms of um, Parang, one thing that's interesting with Parang, and I always say, I don't, I don't like to get into origin debates. Where did something come from? But a lot of times in Trinidad, there'll be this debate. Oh, is it is it, is it Venezuelan or is it is it Trinidadian? And for me, in, in, in my research, I, I think we need to really understand Trinidad and Venezuela as border countries and the close relationship that they've had historically to where Trinidad was really kind of an extension of, of Venezuela at one point, and there's always back and forth. And so for me, I don't ever look at Parang as being Venezuelan or Trinidadian. They each have their own, I guess, lineages of the genre, um, but I don't like to go into this back, oh, it's Venezuelan, you know, it's, you know, we gotta give it credit, they're old Trinidad. No, there, there's too much back and forth. And even in my own family, just seeing the back and forth, between Trinidad and Venezuela. But so Trinidad was a Spanish colony from 1498 until 1797 when it was ceded to, to the British. But a lot of times people think Trinidad was a French colony at one point, but it wasn't. So in, in 1783, because Trinidad was underpopulated, uh, the Spanish who had control at that time, they had a cedula de población, which essentially is a, a decree that allowed um, Catholics from other countries to come to Trinidad and to settle there. And they were given a certain amount of land and things like that. And especially with all the unrest that was going on with the French and then also the Haitian Revolution was, was emerging as well. A lot of French planters came to Trinidad with their slaves and Trinidad became populated that way. So Trinidad was a Spanish colony and, and they said for a long time Trinidad was a uh, a British country when it was ceded to, to the Brits with, with Spanish laws and French culture. Um, but there's also, I think it's really important, um, as you mentioned, to kind of just recognize the history, but also recognize the migrations that have taken place and that continue to take place within the Caribbean. Sometimes we really kind of have these national identities that don't really um, acknowledge the extent of migrations in the Caribbean and the influences, you know, um, so Trinidad, yes, Venezuela, but we also have people coming from Barbados, from Grenada, from all over. And then, you know, you look at Cuba and, and Cuba is, is close to Jamaica and Haiti and all the connections and the back and forth there. And there's just a lot. And I think we really need to kind of sometimes step back and really look at the influence of those migrations on the music and on the culture. And simultaneously, how the music and culture is a way of us reflecting that, right? For those who may have not been familiar in the same sense with this deeper, you know, colonial history that you've outlined so well for us. If you sat and listened to Parang, you'd be like, okay, clearly there's something, you know, going on here that's different from Steel Pen or that's different than Calypso. But there is clearly like a historical reason um, migrations, et cetera, as you outlined, that are then leading to this. And so I think that, I mean, off bat for me, brings us largely to our conversation. There are so many ways you can describe and point to how music and social justice and just, you know, describing society can connect, um, especially in the ways that it impacts our communities, especially as people of color, as former and for some islands current colonized subjects. So how have you just come to understand music and social justice as working together, whether that's in your own work, um, in your personal life and how it affects us and empowers us as the Caribbean community? You know, starting at an early age and just thinking about um, the songs, you know, that we would sing in, in chorus um, that related to Black people fighting for their freedom in the United States. You know, there are a lot of those songs. And so a lot of times I think people think of social justice songs and they think of like, we shall overcome and oh, freedom and things like that. For me, and especially since starting grad school, for me, um, music and social justice has really been about the ways that we 
we speak about music and that in particularly how we teach music in our schools. And so a lot of the, the work that I've been doing has been around helping others to see the value in our music and not just in the sound of it, because I think, you know, people think of Caribbean music, they think of black music and that, you know, it's all over the world. It's, it's international. People love the sound of the music, but I don't think we've really kind of dealt with how um, systemic issues within our schools continue to devalue our music and by extension devalue us. Um, I got my PhD in ethnomusicology, which if I was to put it, I guess, in kind of the most simplistic language or in a way that can be easily understood is that it's uh, really the study of, of music in culture or the study of music as culture. And sometimes I explain it as a combination of, of musicology and anthropology. And I started grad school literally a few weeks after my mentor, uh, Dr. Lise Waxer. And the reason that I had um, gone into ethnomusicology because she was an ethnomusicologist at, at Trinity College, um, she passed away at the age of 37. And so I started grad school without her mentorship and everything that she was and everything that I wanted to be, I didn't find in the discipline. And by that, I mean, I went to a space where historically and to this day, the majority of people who are practicing ethnomusicology are, are white people who are studying the music of other cultures or the music of the quote unquote non-Western people. And one of the things that was very shocking to me was, especially at the time that I started, um, there was this notion of publish or perish. So, you know, scholars need to be publishing all the time or they're just not going to make it. But I found it problematic because it takes a long time to understand the culture. And a lot of times you have people starting grad school and let's say you have somebody, I don't know, I'm just making this up, a white person from Ohio who, you know, decides um, he's going to study the music, I don't know, steel, let's just say steel pan in Trinidad, doesn't know anything about Trinidad, heard it one day and said, oh, I, I like this, this is interesting, it's fascinating, you know, I'd like to look more into this, um, begin studying it year one by year two, year three, the person is publishing on it. And I think sometimes, um, especially in music studies, there's this notion that you can just understand music by the sound of it, but not really necessarily have a deep understanding of the culture. And I say even people who have studied another culture for years sometimes will not understand the nuances of that culture or things that are really significant to people. That was, that was a big problem for me. I, I saw it as undermining you know, people of color, especially since in, in, in the United States, a lot of academic writings that uh, students are reading are from, from white authors in, in my field, I'll say at, at least, we're not hearing the voices of the people who are creating this music and not hearing how they understand the music, how they perceive the music. And so as I continued this journey in the field of music, I realized the same thing was happening with K through 12 education. Um, first of all, music of the Caribbean or other cultures, really, they weren't being taught, at least not in any kind of serious way. And then when they were taught, um, they weren't being taught, um, for lack of a better term, correctly, right? Um, because the teachers did not understand the culture. They didn't understand what was important. So I'll give an example. Um, you might have someone who has studied steel pan for years, and this is a true story. I've, I've met people who have told me they studied steel pan for years. They played in um, school ensembles and they never once learned about the history of Pan. To me, that's sacrilegious. How do you, how do, you do that, right? And so you're learning about the music and, and you can then make money off of the music and maybe create albums and those sorts of things, but people don't really know anything about the people who created those sounds. I actually saw in a, uh, an article, I wanna say, uh, not last year, it was 2022, maybe the end of 2021, there's an article in a, a well-known uh, magazine uh, that talked about a pantunist, a white pantunist, and never once mentioned that Pan was from Trinidad and Tobago. Not, not even just a, a quick blurb. Um, so for me, those are the kinds of things, when I think about uh, social justice in music, those are things that I'm, I'm trying to rectify, that I'm working to get people to understand the value of not just the music, but how music is so connected to our way of life, to our being, to our ways of thinking. I um, mean, the Caribbean has, you know, many cultures and ethnicities. Um, a lot of times my focus is on Afro-diasporic musics, um, but this applies, I think, to, to non-Western people in general who have experienced um, colonialism and imperialism 
um, and the devaluing of their, their culture. Adding to that point, there are just so many ways that music does something that maybe education and I when I say education I mean that in the very like most banal sterile way right especially when we are being educated with these imperial notions in mind right to hear our history through song um or to hear the ways that we can be empowered through music takes a different shape on how we grow and evolve as people right I was having a conversation um very recently about the ways this person was saying that they have felt empowered through music um, and how music has taught them different things about themselves, but that's a source of empowerment felt like they never were able to access, you know, in mm. academia or in other ways. And so I think beyond, or in addition to your point on social justice, what have you seen in your work, just how many of the different ways there are that people can hone into music as a source of empowerment? There are many different um, steps and I don't, I don't think there's just one, but you know, um, you're talking about your, your friend just being able to access your music in academic spaces or in educational spaces. And things are changing, um, but th multiple things have to change at the same time in order for us to get to where we need to be. So I'm just thinking, for example, you know, when I was growing up in the 80s and, and 90s, there were a lot of, of programs to kind of, you know, teach the quote unquote inner city kids like classical music and things like that. And that's not a bad thing. I would say learn as much music and any kind of music that you want. But I think it was in, in some ways kind of this civilizing project, right? Um, it would have been good for these kids to see music of their own culture because then it gets valued. The things that we put in educational spaces, we kind of give a certain privilege to it. And we think of it as better than. And so when we're not seeing our own music in schools and being taught, there's, there's a problem with that. And so I think it has to be done in terms of the music that we see in the schools. Um, and I'll say it actually in a, in a couple of ways. So I have, I actually have a framework that I had devised to help you know, artists, teachers, educators to really kind of think about social justice issues in music. And it's called Canon People Pedagogies or CPP. And so the canon refers to really like the kinds of music that we're actually seeing in our schools. So what are we listening to? Historically, it's been okay, you know, the Bach, the Beethovens, the Mozarts, those are the things that were pushed in schools. Even if you think of like music appreciation classes, that was the kind of music that was being appreciated. In terms of social justice, you know, you could say everyone, but especially our kids, because we need to we need to be able to validate ourselves, right? That's important for building our self-esteem and confidence and being able to move in the world. Um, so really looking at the canon, the, the music that's taught in the schools, also the instruments that are used, um, and the way that we receive knowledge. So when I say that, I mean, is it oral knowledge? Is it written knowledge? And and do we put more value over one? Traditionally we put more value over the written knowledge than the oral knowledge. And then I say people. And people refers to the, the people who are actually teaching in our schools. Um, and then I, I've actually brought in that to include administrators and also um, people who create educational materials like publishers and people who create and, and, and sell instruments. And the reason for that is that in, in music education, the vast majority of teachers are white. And the statistics vary, but it's anywhere between like 70 to close to 90% of the teachers are white. And so for me, um, again, music and social justice is not just about the actual sound. I'm thinking of it in terms of, of equity for Black people, for Caribbean people to be able to get jobs in the school system. So if we're not teaching, we're missing out a chunk of the, of the pie, especially in places like where I am in, in New York City, where teachers actually get um, pretty decent pay compared to the rest of the country and you know pension and, and benefits where the opportunities for artists and musicians to enter the educational space, instead of just saying, okay, well, we'll teach white teachers how to do this and then they will teach. They should also know how to teach too and they should be exposed. But if we have people who are experts in a certain tradition and they know it, they should be allowed to enter those spaces. And then the pedagogy is when I talk about just how we actually teach. So a lot of times, even if we bring Caribbean music into the schools, Teachers may teach it the same way that they might teach, you know, 
a Bach or a, a Beethoven or Mozart and not really look at the teaching strategies that are, are um, particular to the Caribbean or Afro diasporic musics. And so that we also need to be looking at that too, because if you're bringing in Caribbean music, but you're only validating Western ways of teaching, that's also problematic, right? And so I see social justice in all these areas. And again, not, not just in the sound of the music, but, but also how we teach the music um, and who's teaching the music and those sorts of things. And that's been a, an evolution for me over time, just because being in an educational space for so long, I started seeing why we weren't really getting to where we needed to be. Or sometimes the way things are just performative, to be quite honest. You know, it can be very easy to say, oh, okay, well, we'll just add all these songs to our repertoire and we'll just include a lot of Caribbean music. Um, but if you don't know how to teach it, you can actually do more harm than than good. Because there, there, I hate to say, but there are a lot of ignorant teachers out there, <laughs> you know, and if you don't know what you're teaching, you, you really can do more harm than good. When you were talking about um, slices of the pie outside of, you know, being in the Caribbean diaspora, I also thought of how this affects us at home, right? And so I know most, this is not just the Caribbean, I've talked to, you know, friends from all over the world, but um, we always feel like that we've got the standard three jobs, you know, your parents are like doctor, lawyer, engineer. Um, and outside of those things, if you're not doing that, you're not doing much. Uh, there is so much talent, I think, especially creatively, um, especially musically, that if we tapped into the power of our creation, we would have access to that pie, right? Like, there are artists making music and maybe it's not always artists or that might not be the the best one to reference because you know there can only be so many Beyonce's or so many Bob Marley's or whatever you want to um frame that as right but there are light designers and jewelry makers and you know I don't know various different ways that we can position um what music and art and creativity look like that you know especially when you consider the massive wealth that is the Caribbean in terms of our music composition and the way that it's marketed, you know, you think of dance hall in Japan, like is huge um, and all of these other things. There are really integral ways that we could be shaping and developing, you know, had we or should we be tapping into our creative wealth a little bit more? I always think about that, like all the different kinds of jobs and and, and opportunities that, that people can have. I mean, I feel that sometimes we don't know that those opportunities exist, but I also think sometimes it's because they're not presented to us. And so I think of, for example, you know, um, you know, how many of us are really kind of thinking about, you know, scoring music for a, for a film or something like that. When I was applying for grad schools, and I actually had thought about um, composition and arranging, I thought actually of applying to a school for composition and arranging, and I would have done jazz composition and arranging just because that was, I think, the only thing that I thought would give me the freedom. Composition programs, you know, would I be able to get in with, you know, if I did a piece on like Caribbean music, you know, those things, I think that's slightly changing now. But a lot of those opportunities haven't been there in the past. And I think sometimes when the opportunities aren't there, you know, people don't know um, that that's a possibility, you know? So we have to have these examples so that we can say, oh, that's a possibility. I can do that. I think that's changing now. Um, is it changing? Things never change fast enough for me, but, <laughs> um, but I think that's changing now. But yeah, they're just, what are the different avenues? And as you said, yeah, it's not just being a doctor, a lawyer, or engineer or whatever. There, there are many opportunities. And I always say, you know, we have to value everyone's skills right because i might do music but i i can't even draw a straight line right so i i'm not going to be a visual artist you know at any point in time but we really need to value people's skills i i personally believe everyone is here for a reason and to fulfill a certain job and i think we need to value everyone's jobs equally because we we are part of a whole and without their piece of them doing that work you know, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. And so I, th I think that's something just across the board, you know, we value certain people in certain positions and things that look big and grand better than things that look 
small because you mentioned the light de you know designer right people don't even think about that but that's really important to whether it's theater or film things like that and so without you know the light designer you know you wouldn't get the show on the road so to speak so yeah in terms of teaching we've talked a lot about the ways that music um edu and education definitely come together and you've done this very integrally in your own practice through your company my people tell stories um but could you talk a bit about how we can truly reclaim our stories about our music how it's taught how you know the ways for it to be better instructed in schools whether that's in the caribbean or in the diaspora and it the you know overwhelmingly positive potential it has you know the tagline for my my people tell stories is if you're not telling your own stories someone else is telling them for you you know for me it's we we actually just have to tell our stories and really reclaim them and make people aware that there's value in us telling our stories so you know for me again in ethnomusicology you know it's a lot of white people telling other people's stories and so for me one of the ways that i decided to reclaim my my story is um, I left the I left the tenure track position, and I said I'm going to start my people tell stories. And the first project of my people tell stories was, I wrote a book called East of Flatbush, North of Love, and Ethnography of Home. And that book for me was my way to reclaim my story, but also tell the story in a way that validated who I was, validated my upbringing, validated um, my culture. And so traditionally in ethnomusicology, uh, professors uh, need to write an eth ethnography. Ethnography is a practice. So really it refers to people going to um, a site and studying, in this case would be the music and culture of a people um, through what's called participant observation. So they're observing the people, but they're also kind of participating in the, the lives and culture of these people. As I mentioned before, mostly, um, in ethnomusicology, people are studying music outside of their culture. And so for me, East of Flatbush, North of Love, I called it an ethnographic memoir because it wasn't just an ethnography, it was also me using my experiences growing up in Brooklyn, in a Caribbean enclave to Trinidadian parents um, to tell a story about um, Caribbean culture, history, um, colonialism, imperialism, racism, a lot of the isms I talk about, but I use my story to kind of um, as a base point to talk about all of these issues. And I also use music. Music is really central in the book because I have a, a running playlist. And so I use music as a as a way to talk about um, certain topics or as an entry point. Uh, so for example, you know, talking about you know, my mom teaching us a lot about Trinidadian history and culture through song. You know, she would sing Jean and Dinah, uh, for example, which is uh, one of Sparrow's most well-known um, songs where he talks about the U.S. presence um, in Trinidad, um, but looking at it through through the, the, the lens of prostitution. And so, you know, that's one of the songs that I used to talk about that. Or Black is Beautiful, um, when my mom would t tell me about you know, Black power in the 1970s. And so really just using music, because again, in, in the Caribbean, you know, music is telling you about things that are happening in the moment on the ground, especially certain genres, you know, like Calypso. And so I wanted to tell the story like that, which was very different than how I would have probably told it had I remained um, in academia. Um, so I just think it's about us, you know, using our own creativity and doing things you know, the way that we want to do it. And, you know, I'm not saying, oh, it's free for all and everybody just, you know, kind of go wild, but really valuing, you know, our own culture, our music, the way that we tell stories, um, instead of doing things in this kind of rigid way that's been handed down to us. And um, I think it's going to look different for, for everyone. You know, I don't have a, a prescription um, for people, but I, I will say, take pride in what you do and value it. And I, I would also say, you know, I think this is for any culture, you know, especially if you're in, if you're growing up in an enclave, whether it's, you know, a Caribbean enclave, a East Asian enclave or wherever, make sure that your music is present in your schools, especially, especially K through 12, make sure that it's represented. 
because we need to have things to validate us. Um, you know, we're living still on the specter of colonialism, of imperialism, of racism, um, and we need those things to strengthen us to value where we come from. You know, and the kids may not unnecessarily understand it, you know, but I think anyone who's grown up in a in a culture that that believes itself and, and validates itself can appreciate that years down the line. You know, they'll understand why they have this kind of fortitude. Thank you for that. I, I think it's something that I've thought about more recently, but also I'm like, I came to this as a full grown adult, right? Um, I even remember when I started playing piano as a kid and, you know, there was a session about like, who are your influences? And I started playing piano right at the height of Alicia Keys and Fallen, right? Like mm. that was my moment for me. And <laughs> all the other faces in my class were like, Bach. And, and I was like, I don't really care about these, you know, old white men that you guys are referencing. I wanted to like have the key earring um, that, and you know, because representation matters. And, you know, to your point, right? While we may not necessarily get it, get the why of it as a kid, um, even my kid self very much so understood that having somebody who looked like me playing piano wasn't enough of an influence for me to really want to do it. Mm. Um, yeah, I did want to say you gave us some songs um, like Sparrow's song to check out for our Strictly Fact sounds. But do you have any others that you think are great examples of how music is connected to our history and culture? So I, have, I probably have more songs in my head than I can like pull out <laughs> um but there there's one song I, I mentioned it um black is beautiful by the mighty duke and i just for me it's a again it's a powerful song just in terms of validating you know um who we are and and having this uh just being prideful and you know my my mom used to sing a lot of these songs to us and we always joke that my mom can't sing for anything but but she always used to sing these songs um you know say it loud i'm black and i'm proud black is beautiful um and i think it's it's just really important for us to be reminded of that i don't know if you're uh, if you're familiar with it I sing a if i may i might sing a little bit of it kind of a little my version i guess uh many 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 years it took now we have found the natural look Many, many, many years it took us to find this natural look. Suddenly, out of the blue, this thing has struck like something new. Everybody, young and old, growing Afro and telling the world, they're singing, Black is beautiful, Black is beautiful. Lift your head like me. You got to wear me color with dignity. Black is beautiful. Black is beautiful. Say I'm black and proud. It's high time that we get rid of that old slave mentality. Thank you. Oh, that was such a great, I feel like it was also our first live Strictly Facts performance. So I oh. appreciate you sharing that with us but and even to our point right like that song a is obviously passing down the history right that carries beyond the 70s that was its time right and it it's a marker of how far we've gone and how far we still need to go but thank you so much for sharing well, that with you. us dr brown thank you and thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate having the opportunity to, to talk with you about um, these issues and just talk a little bit about the work that I do. So thank you. Of course. Um, and as everyone knows, I will, of course, have links to Dr. Brown's work and her company as well in our show notes that you can check out. Listeners, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, so more music, more history, more Strictly Facts in the next episode. Look more. Thanks for tuning in to Strictly Facts. Visit strictlyfactspodcast.com for more information from each episode. Follow us at Strictly Facts Pod on Instagram and Facebook and at Strictly Facts PD on Twitter.